name is Josh Myers. I teach Africana Studies at Howard University. Freedom Freedom Radio. Radio. Freedom Radio. Radio. Let's let's take a little walk real quick since we're on the campus, brother. Let, talk a little bit about yourself, uh, where we are right now, and your role that you uh, play on campus. Okay. Uh, this is a space called the Upper Quadrangle of Howard University. Um, behind me is Founders Library, uh, probably one of the main spaces uh, on campus. Um, it houses the university libraries, obviously, but it also houses uh, the offices of the Department of Afro-American Studies, where I teach Africana Studies. Um, I've been there since uh, fall of 2013. Um, I do what I guess we call intellectual history courses. Um, I deal with the change in time um, in terms of the ideas that black people dealt with over time. Um, a lot of it, of course, is about trying to figure out a way of seeing black thought that is not contained by you know, other people's lenses. And so a lot of my work is not just about this, the history of black thought, but how we actually engage the meaning of black thought and what that looks like uh, from an Africana studies lens. And so it, 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 it involves, of course, dealing with a range of different thinkers. And of course, Howard University is an important space um, because it, it, it housed many thinkers. And a lot of the elaboration of black intellectual history occurred on, on this campus, um, on this space. You have a project, actually, that you're involved with coordinating right now yeah. um, called the Black Power Chronicles, correct? Sure. Talk yeah. a little bit about that and the importance of that documentation of that specific time period. Yeah, so Black Power um, as a move, as a, a kind of era, um, is a critical uh, historiographical pursuit in these particular moments. Um, uh, and there was in 2010 a coming together of SNCC veterans, part of what was called the SNCC Legacy Project, where they tried to come up with a, a organization that was going to document the history accurately. And part of what that project uh, is undertaking right now is a project called Black Power Chronicles. Black Power Chronicles is an attempt to rewrite, or retell, I should say, uh, the history of Black Power through the lens of its actual participants. And so we have um, chapters all across the country. I'm working with the DC chapter. I'm the coordinator of the Oral History Committee, or one of the coordinators of, of the Oral History Committee of the DC chapter of Black Power Chronicles. And it's important uh, for those uh, reasons I just said, but it's also important that we come up with an archive, an archive that is actually controlled by black people, that is controlled by people who are not necessarily um, opposed or situated in opposition to black liberation or the black liberation movement an archive that is actually built and generated out of the very struggle that produced the, its contents. And that's probably why this archive that we're building is going to be uh, unique. It's going to be an archive that's built by the veterans of the movement and themselves. And it's an archive geared towards creating, creating new histories um, of the movement that's going to actually center um, the struggle in ways that have not been done so far. Um, as something that was larger than this kind of pursuit of American democracy that we're beginning to see grafted on towards black power uh, by many of its theoreticians. And I think you can't do justice to black power through an American lens. It has to be um, understood in ways that privilege black thought, and black thought has never been irreducible to what American democracy is. And I think that's a, a critical part of what we're trying to do uh, with black power. So if you are out there and you participate, we would love to sit down and talk with you and get your perspective and so we can, so that we can build this archive, this oral history and this archive um, that we're going to be putting together in the, in the coming year. So with this particular, you know, the subject matter of, of the Black Power uh, Movement, mm -hmm. uh, Black Liberation Movement and this, the move to archive and document that, mm -hmm. why is th this not a part of <clears throat> a wider uh, documentation in academia or even uh, community for that matter? Well, academia, you know, there are document, there is an arc, there are, are archives, there's just not one single space where you would go. There are a number of art places where you can really get the story of what happened in these years. The question, I think, is about not only what is in the archive, it, it's, it's, the, it's the nature of the um, whether or not the archives are well taken care of, it's also about um, the management of and the location 
of whatever archives they are. Mm -hmm. There are. Um, so it's, it's the complicated nature of where where can you go to create black space to create black archives. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, have very limited spaces to do the kinds of work that we want to do. Now, in terms of the historiographical question about the 68 and 75, a lot of it is given over to a kind of nihilistic evolution of, of the movement because what happens for, for the movement during those years is it never really fits the models of what America thinks black people should be doing because black people took their, took their own initiative and created their own spaces to do things that were unique um, to their struggle, particularly the questions and quite dealing with questions of race and class that ne didn't necessarily fit in the models of American political activity that were, that were then present. And even when they did, Black people interrupted those spaces like the Democratic National Convention and, you know, with the National Black Independent uh, Parties, the National Black Political Convention. Oh, Mr. Brown, one further question. Uh, uh, how do you deal with the problem of black orientated stations that play black music but are white control and they often in the black neighborhood? Is this a serious problem? You're talking about the white control, sock and soul? make your knees freeze and your liver quiver. Those stations ought to be dealt with by the black community. The black community cannot stand around and have pool room arguments about how bad a local station is owned by a white man selling us broken down furniture, a finance company that's robbing us, and a car that breaks down before we get a block away from it with a Negro sitting there talking a bunch of garbage, calling himself a black disc jockey. Now, the community has to be the person ultimately responsible. The community must move on those stations and on those Negroes representing black interests. So yeah, I think it's a question of documentation, it's a question of where the archive is going to be, and it's also a question, ultimately, of where we're going to situate the narrative of American democracy. I keep going back to that. And so we can collect archives, we can collect documents, but ultimately if we don't interpret our histories differently, the archives will matter less, I think. My name is Josh Myers. I am Assistant Professor of Africana Studies in the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. I am also one of the coordinators of the Oral History Committee of the DC Black Power Chronicles Project, an initiative of the SNCC Legacy Project. I'm currently working on a narrative history of the 1989 student protests here at Howard University. You're watching Freedom Radio. Freedom, freedom, radio. Freedom, freedom, radio. radio. My name is Josh Myers. This is the Black Power Chronicles uh, interview of Ralph Crowder III. Ralph Crowder, thanks for joining us. Yes, peace. I'm glad to be here. So, Ralph, you are a son of the movement. Yes. From Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Yeah, originally from Minneapolis, yes. Tell us how you grew up. 